Well, my thought for that song, um, you know how you've been in scenarios where you want to pray with your child, but you're you're not sure you want to take the risk, you know? Um, those of us who have raised kids, I assume I'm not the only one who's kind of had that dilemma that there's times you verbalize and you pray, and then there's those times you wonder, if I pray this out loud, God, are you going to answer the prayer? Or do I take that risk that I'm going to teach my child something that maybe I shouldn't be teaching them? And I had one, one of those opportunities this week. Uh, our family walked up to a friend's house around the block and when we walk back, the, the stars are just lit up. I mean, it was, what was that, Friday night? Um, it, one, one night late last week, brilliant stars. And we're commenting on them, and I happened to mention, oh, I wonder if we'll see a shooting star. Well, that is Sienna's, like, soft spot. All of us have seen shooting stars, except for poor little Sienna. And every time that we've seen a shooting star, my four-year-old, and then she was five, and then she's six, and now she's seven, always misses it. And so after I verbalized it, I thought, oh, I should have put a filter on that, because I know she's sensitive about it. And uh, she got sad, mopey, uh, on the way home, and not quite crying, but almost. I never get to see shooting stars. And so we got to the house, and... I said, Sienna, I tell you what, do you want to lay out on our front yard with me for like, I don't know, five or ten minutes, and we'll look for a shooting star. I mean, they're really hard to see, honey. Yeah, yeah, we could do that. So Sienna and I grabbed some pool noodles that we used for youth group the other week and used them as pillows. We're laying on uh, front yard, and I'm having this conversation with God. God, should I pray out loud in front of Sienna? that we see a shooting star. And I chickened out and said, I don't want to upset her little heart that's already sensitive because she never sees them. And if I ask God and God chooses not to, what's that going to do to my little girl's heart? And uh, I'm in that place, right? Um, She points up and she says, this is about five minutes in. She points up and she says, Daddy, can you see the full-on penguin in the stars? Full-on penguin? I don't remember that constellation. <laughs> and she, she starts describing with her little finger up, we're prone, horizontal. Um, she points up and she starts trying to describe, you know, that star up there. We're both looking in exactly the same place. Wouldn't you know it? Voop. Shooting star came by, right in the place her little finger was pointing. And I had that moment of, Sienna, I love you. But do you know who loves you even more? Your heavenly father. What a great gift. What a great moment. And then singing that song, you know, on one level, that's just a shooting star. On another level are those deep, resonant movements. Father loves you guys. He's in love with you. The reason he gives us his word, the the reason that we're going through the book of Ecclesiastes is because good fathers want their children to be wise. Amen, dads? Good dads want their kids to be wise. And your heavenly father wants you to be wise because he loves you. Not because he's angry at you, but because he loves you. So he offers you his word, and we're going to drop into Ecclesiastes chapter 8. If you can turn there with me, we'll start in verse 1. And uh, as you make your way there, there are, if I ask you, what is the most difficult thing in the world right now, most of us would answer that with some kind of political, uh, social, maybe economic answer. 
that the, the most challenging thing, the worst thing in the world is this. Maybe it's a conflict in another part. Maybe it's uh, racial tension in this country. Maybe it's the economic plight of those who are really suffering throughout the world. Most of us would answer that in some external kind of way. Because that's how Americans tend to view the world. That the problems are out there. They're external to me. They're a circumstance. It's an entity. It's another person. That's one way to view the world. And so, um, actually, that kind of view brought in the Enlightenment, where if we could just get more knowledge, if we could just understand more, if we could just invent more, we could do some amazing things, and we have. We have done amazing things. It's just that there's a whole lot of things still left to be done. It didn't solve the issues, it just helped. And I am not against movement. I am not against technology. I actually really love the guy that invented AC, whoever he was. Progressing knowledge, science, It's been a great help, but it has not eradicated the problems of the world, right? We can all agree to that. It's helped in certain circumstances, but it hasn't solved the the human dilemma. I think the reason is because that's only one way of looking at the world, that problems are out there somewhere and they just need to be fixed and they just need to be solved or understood. The second way to look at the world and to look at the problems, I think it is a little more biblical. It's a very holistic, internal, I'm a big part of the problem. It's not always out there. It's not just a circumstance. It's a heart condition. And it's not just for me, it's for us. And it's not just for us, it's for the whole world. That the whole world has been broken that we looked at last week in Genesis 3. That the whole world is infected. All the individuals are infected by sin. We all have greed. We all have selfishness. And there's been a lot of hurt that's happened, not because of external things, but because of the internal. Right? Biblically, I think that's how God views it. it. It's a holistic view. It's not just problems to be solved. It's people involved in the problems the need to be solved. Last week we we mentioned that we're living in this post-Genesis 2 world. This is an individual level, that sin has just greatly affected me, it's greatly affected everyone. The evidence for this is nobody that I have ever met has ever had to teach their child to bite another child. Somehow, that just kind of comes naturally. It's just kind of like, hey, that's a great idea. And then they get the toy and they're actually happy while the other kid's crying off to the, to the teacher. Why is that? Why don't we have to teach that? Why do we teach wisdom? And why do we teach Jesus? And why do we teach good choices to our kids? Because it's not natural. The natural inclination of the heart is over towards our brokenness. We scream, we whine, we complain, we gossip, we moan, we bite. All those things are the natural outflow of a post-Genesis 2 world. Individually, this has greatly affected us. But what are churches, institutions, corporations, nations, other than a collection of sin-sick people getting together. And so this whole idea that post-Genesis 2, sin and brokenness has affected the individual, by definition means it's affected the whole structure of everything around us. Governments and schools and churches and all groupings are affected. Surely that's got to be the case. If we're a mess individually, certainly we're a mess together. So the question comes up in Solomon's mind. We've been traveling through the book, hearing his questions, seeking to understand his insights into wisdom in life. And he's going to ask this question today. 
if this is the case, and there's some wise among us, and we can equate um, loving on Christ and following Jesus in terms of wisdom, I think that's an okay correlation. If there's some folks who have found wisdom, some folks whose hearts have been corrected, some folks who God has done something in, that the natural inclination of the heart is changing back towards Genesis 2, how do we navigate in a world that's all messed up together? How do we live? How do we make choices? How do we support? How do we connect? How do we navigate through that kind of world? Solomon addresses this. He's going to use the institution of government as his overlay here. But I think it's pretty legitimate to sub in any group in. Family gatherings, neighborhoods, workplace, schools. Almost doesn't matter. So here we go. Chapter 8, verse 1. Who is like the wise man who knows the explanation of things? Wisdom brightens a a man's face and changes its hard appearance. Just meaning that when you find wisdom, when you find the way to live, when you finally humble your own opinions to the way of wisdom, to the way of Jesus, to, to God's way of living, when you finally humble yourself and find that path, it changes your countenance, right? There's some joy in knowing that God is for you. There's some joy knowing that Jesus has forgiven. There's some joy in knowing that you're in the right place at the right time, going in the right direction. It just changes. And Solomon just picks up on this and says, the wise have a different look about them. Their face is actually lit up. It changes their hard appearance. Verse 2. Obey the king's command, I say. Because you took an oath before God. Obey the king's command, I say, because you took an oath before God. I think a a little more faithful translation in there is, Obey the king's command, I say, because of God's oath to him. But it's not so much in the Hebrew that this is written in. Because you took an oath to the king, you've got to obey him. It's more the other direction. You better obey the king because God has an oath to him. A lot of the the translations pick that up. It's the first idea of navigating in this broken world. Be careful who you hitch up with. Be very careful who you hitch up with. He's speaking about the king, but submission is a part of everyone's life, right? Right? You have people in your life, I hope, that you are living in submission to, that you choose to submit to. That could be at work. And so you enter an agreement that you submit to your boss, you submit to your employer. It could be at school, we're going to submit to our teachers, to the principals, to the structure at school. Husband and wife and marriage, there's a mutual submission that happens. Even in friendship, there's got to be a level of submission in friendship as I become vulnerable in order to thrive. I can't always dominate a friendship in order for the friendship to happen. In every circle, there's some level of submission, having to take the risk of being known and vulnerable. Maybe to be betrayed and pummeled in that relationship. Be careful who you choose to submit to. Be careful who you're giving influence to in your life. Be careful who you choose to marry. Be careful who you choose to pair up with, who you work for, who you hire, who you vote for. Why is it such a big deal? Well, here you go. He tells us in verse 3. Do not be in a hurry to leave the king's presence. Do not stand up for a bad cause, for he will do whatever he pleases. Since a king's word is supreme, who can say to him, what are you doing? Be careful who you submit to, because once you've submitted to it, 
You're a part of it. And it might be out of your control. And in that relationship, it's very possible that you can get pulled away from what's right and from what pleases God. Eighteen years ago, I chose to submit to the leaders at FCCB. Uh, the elders, we, we function together. It, it, it's a team, but they're also the community that has authority over me that I submit to. It, it's mutual. It, it's submissive. And I, I remember Pastor Ed was the pastor at the time. And I, I remember coming up and Esther and I were engaged and we're checking the church out. And then we got married right before we came up. And that whole stretch, I remember having the thought, who is this church? Who are these people? And what direction are we going in together? Because it's important to me, for me to submit my life, I better be on guard. I better know. I better ask. Discipleship was one of the first things that came up at at the time. That I know we're going there, we're not there yet, but that's going to be the main thrust of the church. And it resonated, resonated with my heart to say, if that's where we're going together, I will gladly submit to that. I would love to give my life to make disciples for the glory of God. I have a, a friend struggling with work. We had a, a conversation last week. And uh, I love the fact that in his heart is wrestling with, can I submit to my employers and where they're going at work? And there's a wrestling going on there that may have some big implications on the other side. It's a good question to ask. Be careful who you submit to. Rarely, I hope rarely, am I ashamed to enter uh, maybe what's considered political territory. For me, I don't think there are boundaries when it comes to God's heart on issues, when it comes to moral discretion, because so much is moral and godly and needs to be navigated. But I'll just say this. Be very careful who you hitch up with when we cast our votes. Because there's a level of submission that will happen. To say, I will choose to submit to that direction. I will choose to submit to the king. Be very careful who we support. For the primary call on your life is not for a certain candidate to win or not win. The primary call on our life is to be faithful to what Christ has asked of you. And can we be faithful of what Christ has asked for us if we hitch our wagon to certain people, certain politicians, certain groups, certain employers? Be careful who we submit to. He goes on in verse 5. Whoever obeys his command will come to no harm. And the wise heart will know the proper time and procedure. For there is a proper time and procedure for every matter. Though a man's misery weighs heavily upon him. There's a proper time that the wise are going to know the way. Here's a, hopefully a fun question for you. Whether you're a student, whether you're retired, how many of you thought five, ten years ago that the life you're living right now would be the life that you would be living? How many of you? All right. All right. Carol's kind of like, yeah, I I thought I'd be doing what what I'm doing. So one out out of a hundred, not bad. I mean, isn't the fact of the matter... Life and relationships and experiences and education and choices, all of it kind of rolls together to put out a life that you perhaps didn't envision for yourself. 
Maybe it's the type of home you're living in. Maybe it's the income. Maybe it's the retirement. Maybe it's the college you're choosing. Maybe it's the relationship you're in. Maybe it's the lack of kids in your home. But whatever it is, few of us cast this 20-year vision of our life, and then we see it lived out just like we were thinking. That's a rare circumstance indeed. For most of us, we don't have it. But here's what the wise have. I may not have the house I was picturing. I may not have the family that I always dreamed of. I may not have the occupation or the education or the relationship that I once envisioned. But there are certain core things that the wise have because at the beginning, they said, it will be this. I will love Jesus. Through all the ups and downs and through all the curveballs, I will be faithful to Jesus. For others, that, that wise at the beginning, they set their direction and they say, I will always love my spouse. I will always be faithful to my partner that God has given me. And they set out in the direction. And it doesn't look like they thought it would look like. And it looks a lot different than they envisioned. But at the end of the day, that core commitment for the wise is still there. It's a block on which life happens. And we could go through countless examples. Men who say, no matter what my employer says, no matter what the pressure is, I will be a man with integrity. And out comes this life that doesn't look like you thought it would, but there's that cornerstone, that building block. Because the wise set at the beginning the direction that they'll head. The wise know the right time. The wise live with a wise heart. They know the proper time and procedure. Someone was bemoaning this week, legitimate, and I want to share this with you for our older population. The older among us, you have wisdom to share. And it's to our shame when we don't probe or listen. And the reason I say that here is because an older friend of mine, who's not part of our church, mentions that he feels like he's at an age where no one particularly cares anymore. It's always about the younger. And he had some reasons to to feel that way, and I was talking with him. And I can't help but think, for some of the older folks among us this morning, you have set your starting blocks You knew what was right and wise and you've been faithful to it. Even as life has gone all over the place, there are these blocks of wisdom that you built your life on that those behind you could really benefit from. To hear your experiences. For you to be willing to share transparently some of the the wounds and pains that have come along the way. And how you've maintained, even through all of that, this faithful thing that Jesus is King, Jesus is Lord, and I'm still walking towards Him through the storm. I have some ideas. Hopefully later this year, uh, we can do something fun together as a congregation to get into some of that. We need to know who we are in Christ and those blocks that will not be moved. To know who we are in Christ and what he's asked of us before we set out and link up. So be careful. Be careful. Be careful primarily what relationships you choose to enter into. Other than the Holy Spirit and God's activity in our life, there is nothing that affects us more than the relationships in our lives. Be very careful who we submit to in relationship. 
it will drive much of what you decide to do. Get the core things right and set out in the direction that Jesus has called. I want to give you one example of this. When we set out as a family, when Esther and I got married, um, as a young guy, I had energy back then that I don't have now. Uh, we came up to uh, FCCB. Um, I had never been a... It's hard telling stories because all my stories are located here at FCCB, and so you're a part of them, and I don't have this plethora of Hey, there's this guy in church. You're, well, it, I mean, you're one of the guys if I tell that story. But uh, when we first came up, it was the first time I had gone into any sort of ministry. Um, still here. I made a, a commitment to Esther. You know, it's one of those wisdom blocks. Because there's certain things I needed to set right, to be wise at all. I needed some things right. I could mess up on other things, but not some of these core things. And one of the commitments that we made together, that I made first to Esther, and then as the kids started coming along, is they would not hear me tell them to do something, ever, because I'm the pastor. Ever. Ever. And I think if you probed over all these years, that has not ever come out of my mouth. Because I will not use my family to leverage my position as pastor. We talk all the time about, well, because you love Jesus, you want to do this, or you've got to do this, or we can't do that. Sometimes because you're a little field, little fields don't just give up. We give it another shot, and we try again, we pick it up, and we'll have those conversations But one of my building blocks at the very beginning to set my priority, here's my priority, following Jesus, being a husband to Esther, being a dad to my kids, and being a pastor. Because you know what I picture? And it's very similar to you in the the spaces Christ has given you. There'll be a day that Jesus, somehow in love, but also in righteousness, will ask me, How did I do? And I think the first one coming off is, how did I do loving Jesus? You're like, well, you made that really easy, God. I mean, I've fallen in love with Jesus. I've messed up a million times, but I've been infatuated with him. I think that the second question coming off my father's tongue will be, how did you do with that woman I gave you? What did you do with her? Because that was your primary task, Scott. And I'll give an answer like, that was a pretty messed up husband. Like, you didn't set Esther up perfectly for this thing, Lord. But at the end of the day, I hope my testimony will be, I loved her, gave my life for her, and because of your work, I'm presenting her to you as Spotless bride like you told me in Ephesians, and I think you see her spotless through the blood of Jesus, and here you go. And then literally, I just picture that third priority in my life to get it right. What about those awesome kids I gave you, Scott? Are you a good father? Did you point them to me? Did you teach them about gospel and grace? And did you invest in them? And did you challenge and admonish them? And did you disciple them and discipline them and encourage them towards me. And you're like, you know what, God, to be honest, that was one of the funnest things you've ever given me to do. And I hope I did well. My heart, my heart was right. Even if I didn't do everything good, here you go. And it's only after that, I think, God that says, well, what about my people? CCD. How'd you shepherd them? I think at that point, the answer is, Lord, I'm just thankful I was the under-shepherd and that you're the chief shepherd. You know, and I loved, and I gave, and I challenged, and I encouraged, and I opened up, and 
we fell together, we rose up together, we got beat down together and tried, but it's not my priority. That's what I'm saying. You guys are incredibly important to me. And I would lay my life down to see Jesus lived out in you more and more. But there are priorities God has given me higher than that. Those are the building blocks. I think that Solomon is saying, be careful who you hook up with, and you've got to get the priorities right. You've got to set it right. The wise do it at the beginning before they ever drop in to the adventure. The wise heart will know the proper time and procedure because there is a proper time and procedure for every matter. It goes on. Verse 7. Since no man knows the future, who can tell him what is to come? No man has power over the wind to contain it, so no one has power over the day of his death. As no one is discharged in the time of war, so wickedness will not release those who practice it. Be careful who you submit to. Be careful who you give power to so you don't get pulled into evil. Know who you are. Know who you're called to be. But this is Solomon after all. And even if you get all that right, you just have this notion, it's still not going to be perfect, right? I mean, Solomon is not the guy that's going to be like, if you get those right... It's going to go well with your soul. Rather, Solomon is a guy that's like, you've got to get those right. But even when you do it, it's still going to be war. You're still going to have some pretty tough times. It's still going to be like a battle is the language he's using here. Which is pretty much the exact opposite of American Christianity. This is what we tend to teach you. Train right, do the right thing, read your Bible every day. Come to church, um, don't do certain things, and your life is going to be great. And we'll put flowers on that statement and try to put some scriptures on that statement that God wants you to be well and to do well and to prosper. And God will increase your wealth if you faithfully give to... What, what we don't tell you often is that There are times in life that you might have 50 bucks in your checking account and you're like, well, I want to give it all to God. And someone behind you is saying, no, you you can't. You need to get some food for your family. Well, no, I'm going to give it all to God and I know that God is going to triple and quadruple the gift I give into his storehouse. And so you write the check only to have it bounce while the church church treasurer when because sometimes it's not all glorious. Sometimes it's not the rosy picture on the other side. Sometimes it's a war and things go south. It's not all prosperity out there, even when we take the right steps. But we tell you, train right, do right, nothing will go wrong. How many veterans do we have out here today? All right. We have a load, so this is a question for you. I can't answer this, but I suspect I know the answer. With all the training that our military goes through to learn how to encounter anything that comes their way, did you ever see bad things happen in the wars you were in? How many of you lost friends through a war? They were not friends that didn't train well. I assume. I assume they train perfectly. It's just sometimes life is like war. Things don't always pan out beautifully and comfortably. And Solomon is just giving us that, that little edge. You don't know when you're going to die. You can't plan it. And sometimes this wickedness thing, it's just like a war. And it, it just comes on us. Conclusion is, so be obedient and trust that God is in control through all these circumstances. Let me read from from verse 9 to the end, and I just want to close with, with one thought here. All this I saw 
as I applied my mind to everything done under the sun. There's a time when a man lords it over others to his own hurt, and then too I saw the wicked buried. Those who used to come and go from the holy place and receive praise in the city where they did this. This too is meaningless. Let me just say, there are people in our circles in Christianity that we lift up as heroes. We come and go from the marketplace and everyone sings their praises. And I can't think of a more dangerous place to place someone than on that pedestal. Because the mighty have a long way to fall. Theologically, why would we ever do that? Theologically, we have one Messiah. His name is Jesus. It's not the mega preacher. It's not the prolific author. They're just broken individuals who are being used by God to do some pretty amazing things. But they're not the Messiah. They shouldn't be cast out as heroes. They're broken men and women in need of the cross like you and I. Which just leads me to share with you, I have disappointed you over these years. If I already have offended you or disappointed or sinned against you, you're welcome. We've gotten that out of the way and maybe the future is better. But there's going to be times that your pastor and your elders fail you because we're, we're men just walking. We're not... Heroes going out in the public with praise. Because that's a dangerous place to be. There'll be times in the future that I sin and I mess up and I do something I shouldn't do and you're affected by it. Maybe it's stuff that the elders never even planned or, or talked about and we'll hit tough places together. But you know what? It's okay. I'm not a mighty hero out there You know, out in the public, singing praises. And if I am to you, I want to open your eyes. I'm not. I'm not. That's an unsafe place for churches to be in. He goes, When the sentence for a crime in verse 11 is not quickly carried out, the hearts of the people are filled with schemes to do wrong. Although a wicked man commits a hundred crimes and still lives a long time, I know that it will go better with God-fearing men who are reverent before God. Yet because the wicked do not fear God, it will not go well with them, and their days will not lengthen like a shadow. Here's something we've all seen. There is something else meaningless that occurs on earth. Righteous men who get what the wicked deserve, and wicked men who get what the righteous deserve. This too, I say, is meaningless. Meaning like, wait, what? No! Why is he getting all the wealth and all the friends and the big... That guy's... He's the the dirtiest guy I've ever met. What's going on with that? And meanwhile, your righteous friend is over here who's loving Jesus and quietly ministering to people and she's struggling to pay the grocery and you're like, wait, that shouldn't happen! That's not right! Solomon, did you notice he sneaks in this eternal perspective on it? I know that it will go better with God-fearing men who are reverent before God. Yet because the wicked do not fear God, it will not go well with them, and their days will not lengthen like a shadow. Because it's not all temporal. When you see those things happen, there's an eternal out there. That God will set all things right. Except this setting right will be eternal. And as soon as I say that, I don't want the wicked being punished for all eternity. I want them to know Jesus then. I'm not jealous of them. I'm sorry for them. I love them. I want to give to them because eternity is hanging in the balance here and God will set things right. And he closes off. Verse 15. So I commend the enjoyment of life. Because nothing is better for man under the sun than to eat and drink and be glad. Then joy will accompany him in his work all the days of the life God has given him under the sun. And here's 
Here's a pretty good closing thought for you on Labor Day weekend here. Be careful who you hitch up with. Set the priorities first. And be faithful to them. Be wise. Be careful who you submit to. Be wise. Be engaged in the battle. And at the end of the day, kick back, enjoy the boat, enjoy the barbecue with friends. Because God is sovereign over it all. And what a tremendous place to be. God, thank you for the people you've given me. God, thank you for the life you've given me. God, thank you for the burgers on the grill and the boat in the lake. As I'm faithful to you, God, you've got this, and I'm so thankful, so eat. Be merry and enjoy the life God has given you. Because, let's be truthful, what else can you do? What else can you do? Be faithful to Jesus and then kick back and enjoy the blessings that God gives you as we journey through this life together. Let me pray and invite our worship team up here. Father, thank you. Thank you for giving us Jesus. I thank you that years ago you changed my heart. I thank you that you did a new creation thing in me. But God, the battle still goes on. I pray for our church. I pray for those who may might be visiting this morning. God, may you help us see the wonderful, pleasant, courageous, righteous, holy friend in Jesus. And God, as we see Jesus more and more, Lord, may we just take great delight in following your path. I pray especially for our young people, but for all of us, God. May you give us great wisdom on who to connect to. Give us great discernment to know who to hitch our wagons to. Lord, I pray that you would give us wise hearts to know the proper time and the proper procedure and to set your things first and to always be pursuing you no matter where life takes us. But at the end of the day, even today, God, would you bless us with friendship? We ask that you would bless us with an enjoyment of the life that you've given us under the sun. And God, may all of our joy all of our thankfulness be glorifying to you through Christ Jesus. And it's in his name we pray.